Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 6th June 2019. The list of articles chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru and Delhi editions are provided here. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below. And for the benefit of smartphone users, the timestamping is also provided in the comment section. Let's move on to the first article discussion. This article is an editorial which is about the solar energy sector of India. The discussion is relevant in prelims preparation under general science. Then in main syllabus, it is relevant in GS paper 2 under the area government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation. Next in GS paper 3, it is relevant under Indian economy and issues relating to planning, mobilization of resources, growth, development and employment also. Then uh, it is also relevant in infrastructure, particularly in energy. Next it is relevant in uh, science and technology. Uh, its development and their applications and effects in everyday life. In this editorial, the author first talks about the solar energy generation in India. He says that India has made a significant progress in creating capacity for solar energy generation in the last few years. And also there is a boost to solar power installation also. Then there is a significant fall in the unit costs of solar power. Here unit cost means the total expenditure incurred by the company to produce, store and sell one unit of a particular product. According to a joint study by Terry and the Climate Policy Initiative in February, by 2030 the unit cost of solar power will fall to rupees 1.9 to rupees 2.3 per kilowatt hour. Then in India, the solar energy has become increasingly competitive in recent years with other alternative sources of energy like wind energy. Then the solar generation capacity of India has expanded 8 times from 2014 to 2019. That is uh, from 2650 megawatt on May 2014 to over 20,000 megawatt or 20 gigawatt on January 31st, 2018. Then again from this to 28,180 megawatt or 28 0.18 gigawatts on March 31st, 2019. This value amounts to 36% of total renewable energy generation. We have discussed many times about the National Solar Mission of India. Under this, the government had an initial target of achieving 20 gigawatts or 20,000 megawatt of solar capacity by 2022. But as we just saw now, we have already achieved this target in 2018 before four years from the target year of 2022. But already in 2014, this was raised five times to 100 gigawatt or 1 lakh megawatt to be achieved by 2022. In the newspaper, this is wrongly given as 2015 instead of 2014. Then among these achievements, India is also in the fifth position among the largest solar power installed capacities. Then world's largest solar plant is in India. It is situated in Kamudi, a town in southern part of Tamil Nadu. Next, the world's largest solar park is also is in India. It is situated at uh, Pavagada Taluk of Tumakuru district of Karnataka. Now, coming back to the article, next the author lists the shortcomings in the solar energy generation of India. The author says the above mentioned rapid progress should have been made earlier. Then even though India is blessed with plenty of sunlight for most of the year, India is still energy deficient. It would have been avoided if India would have taken a lead in solar panel manufacture to generate solar energy a long ago. This is despite the fact that we have a new policy focus on solar plant installation. We need more energy but as, as there is no solar panel manufacturing, this has led to the share of all manufacturing in GDP to almost the same since 1991. It was 16% in 1991 and it remained almost same in 2018 to 19 of about 16.7%. But if we, we have the solar power potential which is clear by our early target achieving of 20 gigawatt. 
this potential offers a manufacturing opportunity also but rather than manufacturing solar panels india is becoming a near monopsonistic buyer a monopsony is a market condition in which there is only one buyer india is nearing that status we know india is uh, regarded as one of the most promising markets to any industry this is also true to the global solar industry instead of this what is happening is that we are relying on low cost chinese imports the chinese imports accounted for 90% of indian imports regarding solar technology so the author is saying that these low cost imports from china have weakened india's ambitions to develop its own solar technology suppliers now this dependency on imports is only of short term benefits to india the author says if this continues india's energy sector will be in the same condition as defense industry of india this is because indian government is spending enormous amounts of money to procure weaponry which has placed india as the world's second largest importer of defense equipment we just saw the shortcomings now the author suggests what can be done to overcome these shortcomings first we have to substitute the imports with manufacturing indigenously now this requires human capabilities technological capabilities and capital in the form of finance regarding the human capabilities and technological capabilities of india the author gives the example of the supply chain of solar photovoltaic panel manufacturing to understand this let us briefly first understand about the solar photovoltaic panel system in solar photovoltaic system this part is called as the photovoltaic part which are also called as pv modules or pv panels or simply solar panels photovoltaic devices generate electricity directly from sunlight through an electronic process this process occurs naturally in certain types of material which are called as uh, semiconductors this pv panels generally face towards the sun they receive the sunlight and convert them into energy the energy is either stored in a battery source or transferred to the grid for distribution now the solar pv modules are made of silicon which is the main component in natural beach sand from this silicon is obtained the process of converting sand into high grade silicon costs high the silicon is collected usually in the form of solid rocks hundreds of these rocks are being melted together at very high temperatures in order to form ingots in the shape of a cylinder then boron is added to the process which will give the silicon a positive electrical polarity after the ingot has cooled down grinding and polishing are being performed on these ingots uh, this gives the ingot a flat sides the next step in the manufacturing process is the silicon ingot is sliced into thin disks which are called as wafers this is because pure silicon is shiny so it can reflect the sunlight back to reduce the amount of sunlight lost an anti reflective coating is put on the silicon wafer now each wafer will be treated and metal conductors are added on to the each surface the conductors give the wafer a grid like matrix on the surface this is the solar cell this will ensure the conversion of solar energy into electricity next the solar cells are soldered together using metal connectors to link the cells these integrated solar cells are the solar panels then these solar panels are assembled based on the requirement now these are the processes involved in manufacturing a solar panel these were given only for the subject understanding just know how it is made not uh, it is not so much important from the examination point of view so the supply chain of solar voltaic panel manufacturing involves uh, silicon production from silicates or sand then uh, production of solar grade silicon ingots then uh, solar wafer manufacturing and finally pv module or solar panel assembly the author says the expenditure and the technicality is more for the first process of solar panel production that is silicon production is more capital intensive than module assembly in india most companies are engaged only in module assembly or both wafer manufacturing and module assembly 
but no indian company is involved in silicon production according to the ministry of new and renewable energy india has a annual solar cell manufacturing capacity of about 3 gigawatts while the average annual demand is 20 gigawatts so there is a lack of 17 gigawatt manufacturing capacity in india but this shortfall is met by imports of solar panels as we discussed earlier these imports can be reduced by some of the solutions mentioned here one is the safeguard duty imposed by the government 25% safeguard duty on solar panel imports from china and malaysia was imposed last year this duty was for a period of one year followed by 20% for the next 6 months and 15% for another 6 this was done on the grounds that such imports were causing serious injury to domestic solar manufacturers this has put locally made panels on par with the imported ones in terms of cost next the author uh, suggests public procurement public procurement uh, refers to the purchase by governments and state owned enterprises of goods services and work then the author says that the government can call bids for solar power plants these bidding should be made with one requirement that is the manufacturing to be made fully in india but in this process no bids may be received as manufacturing facilities for these do not exist now in the country if the bids are large enough with supplies for many years this gives enough time for a greenfield investment to be made for manufacturing the greenfield investment will put many bidders and local manufacturing can then begin a greenfield investment is nothing but uh, it is a type of foreign direct investment when a parent company creates a subsidiary in a different country it is called as a greenfield investment and it starts building its operation from the ground we saw that india's major solar related imports are from china the author lists what are the china's uh, cost advantage which enables it to give in a low cost the first advantage is core competence of china the author states that the six largest chinese manufacturers had core technical competence in semiconductors before they turned to manufacturing solar cell usually it takes time for companies to learn and act using the new technologies but when the solar industry in china began to grow chinese companies already possessed the practical knowledge about the manufacturing of solar cells the author says in contrast indian companies had no learning background in semiconductors when the solar industry in india began to grow from 2011 The second source of cost advantage for China comes from its government policy. The Chinese government has subsidized land acquisition, raw material, labor and export among others, but none of this is matched by the Indian government. Next the author mentions that the Chinese government is adopting an aggressive stance. This is to weaken any planned effort by India to develop its entire supply chain capacity within India. For this China cut financial support to developers and also halted approval for new solar projects in 2018 in its country as a result of this Chinese producers cut prices so as to sustain their manufacturing capacity and sustaining exports to India if sup- if India's supply chain capacity weakens we will depend on the Chinese imports from China this is what China wants Now as a counter measure the author suggests that India should have a solar manufacturing strategy this strategy should reflect the automotive mission plan of India from 2006 to 2016 the mission plan was India to emerge as a destination of choice in the world for design and manufacture of automobiles and auto components and providing additional employment to 25 million people by 2016 This plan made India one of the largest manufacturers of two wheelers, three wheelers, four wheelers and lorries in the world. If the solar manufacturing strategy is also in the same lines, then this would also be a jobs generating strategy for many, including the increasingly better educated youth in both rural and urban. With this, we have come to the end of this analysis. the displayed mains question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next news article which is about gestational diabetes 
The analysis of this news article will be helpful in your prelims preparation under current events of national importance and also under general science. It will also be relevant in your mains preparation in general studies paper 2 under issues relating to development and management of uh, social sector relating to health. The news states that it is very much necessary to test all the pregnant women for gestational diabetes. A timely diagnosis and treatment can prevent children from becoming predisposed to diabetes or other non-communicable diseases. Before seeing the news article in detail, let us see what is meant by gestational diabetes. It is also called as gestational diabetes mellitus. Gestation is nothing but the time between conception or uh, getting pregnant and childbirth. Though we are focusing on human gestation, this term applies more broadly to all mammals. A fetus grows and develops in the womb during the gestation period. As per World Health Organization, diabetes is a chronic disease that occurs because of two reasons. One is when the pancreas does not produce enough insulin. Next, when the body cannot effectively use the insulin it produces. Know that insulin is a hormone that regulates blood sugar. Raised blood sugar level is also called as hyperglycemia. It is a common effect of uncontrolled diabetes and over time it leads to serious damage to many of the body systems, especially the nerves and blood vessels. There are many types of diabetes like type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes etc. Gestational diabetes is one such type of diabetes. As per World Health Organization, Gestational diabetes is hyperglycemia, which means the blood glucose values are above normal but below those levels of regular diabetes. This condition occurs during pregnancy in women. Women in gestational diabetes are at an increased risk of complications during pregnancy and at delivery. They and their children are also at risk of type 2 diabetes in the future. They can also suffer from non-communicable diseases. Here a non-communicable disease means a disease which cannot be transmitted from one person to another. The most common non-communicable diseases that are likely to occur because of gestational diabetes are cardiovascular diseases such as heart attacks and strokes, then uh, hypertension and then obesity also. The gestational diabetes might also lead to low birth weight of baby. Also, there is a risk that the child will be born with diabetes. This condition is called as intergenerational transfer of risk. Gestational diabetes is generally diagnosed through prenatal screening rather than through reported symptoms. Prenatal screening means diagnosis of the baby before birth when the baby is in the mother's womb. Here, the doctor checks for any abnormal conditions in the child's growth while the baby is in the womb of the mother. Let us come back to the news article now. According to a recent research paper, it is necessary that every pregnant woman must be screened for high blood glucose even if no symptoms are exhibited by the pregnant woman. The research was to know if the diabetic risks would be prevented by themselves or if medical intervention is required. In simpler words, the condition where the medical risk factors would be prevented itself is called as primordial prevention. This term is mentioned in the news article. This research mentions that it is necessary and essential to prevent children from becoming predisposed to diabetes or other non-communicable diseases and this should be done by screening the pregnant mothers for diabetes at the earliest stage of development of the fetus. Two points are stressed in this study. One is the birth weight of the newborn and next is the blood sugar levels that the pregnant mother should maintain. The study stu suggests that newborn's birth weight should be appropriate for the gestational age which is 2.5 kilogram to 3.5 kilogram. If this weight is maintained then any possible non-communicable diseases that might develop offspring can be prevented. Offspring is another word for baby. Next, the study suggests that it is essential to make an early diagnosis and ensure the mother maintains ideal blood sugar levels. 
the glucose levels during fasting that is before consuming food must be under 90 milligrams per deciliter and postprandial glucose levels which means after consuming food must be under or uh, 120 milligrams per deciliter. The study tells that there are several reasons for the rising trend of NCD which is due to diabetes and out of these the concept of intrauterine programming has not received adequate attention. This study has quoted David Barker's fetal origin of adult diseases theory. This theory tells that the body's susceptibility to lifestyle diseases was programmed in the intrauterine period that is during the gestational period. When the mother has high blood sugar then there is a high glucose transfer to the fetus. This stimulates the fetal pancreatic cells to start secreting insulin earlier and also in higher quantities. Once this action is initiated it becomes self perpetuating means it keeps on continuing the same action by itself. In addition, when the glucose reading of the pregnant mother is over 110 milligrams per deciliter, the amniotic fluid becomes glucose enriched. Generally, after 20 weeks, the fetus begins to swallow the amniotic fluid, which is its nutrition intake. When the fetus intakes the glucose enriched amniotic fluid, it will further stimulate the production of insulin. So, the child is also likely to suffer from diabetes at an earlier stage in its life. If you see, the Union Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has developed national guidelines for testing, diagnosis and management of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. The guidelines recommend early testing for diabetes at the time of contact, that is during the first trimester or first three months of fetus formation. If the test is negative, then another test should be done between 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy to ensure the blood sugar levels are under control. This news article notes that the state of Uttar Pradesh has implemented this program extremely well. They are even using advanced testing equipments for diabetes which is not seen in other parts of the country. With this, we have come to the end of this analysis. The displayed prelims question will be discussed in the last session. This article is an editorial about the project to remove English from India by replacing it with Hindi. The article discussion is relevant under the area current events of national importance and in public policy under the Indian polity in prelims. The discussion can also be linked to the main syllabus in general studies paper 1 under the area salient features of Indian society, diversity of India. The article discussion can also be linked to regionalism. Then in general studies paper 2, it could come under the area significant provisions of Indian constitution, government policies in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation. This editorial article has appeared because of the recent events related to the mandatory teaching of Hindi. This was proposed by the unrevised draft national education policy of 2019. The author starts with an appreciation for the people of Tamil Nadu for standing up firmly against the attempts to promote Hindi in non-Hindi states. The proposed mandatory provision has been revised or edited in the draft policy after the protest in Tamil Nadu. The author states that the draft national education policy was rightly seen by the people of non-Hindi states as a Trojan horse. The author mentions this is uh, to bring Hindi into non-Hindi states by smuggling under the Trojan horse. Trojan horse refers to a hollow wooden statue of a horse in which the Greeks hid themselves to enter the city of Troy to capture it. The author says similarly the draft policy is a hollow Trojan horse that covered the Hindi language and attempted to make Hindi to enter into the non-Hindi states. Then the author talks about the old three language formula that is implemented almost all over India except the state of Tamil Nadu. This three language formula was established un under the official language resolution of parliament in the year 1968. In a simple manner, this three language formula means the formula for the study of a modern Indian language, preferably one of the southern languages apart from Hindi and English in the Hindi speaking areas. And in the non-Hindi speaking areas, the study of uh, Hindi with the regional language and English. The Tamil Nadu has got an exemption to
to this three language formula due to the people's movement and uh, appropriate political leadership. The author mentions that the Hindi speaking states did not promote the non-Hindi languages as they are required under the resolution. But the non-Hindi states are continuing to teach Hindi. Now, recently the government has uh, removed or edited the clauses for compulsory teaching of Hindi. By this, the government has actually prevented severe backlash or it has prevented severe mass negative reaction from the people of non-Hindi states. The author says that the language policy of India is based on an honorable objective. The honorable objective is to decolonializing all works of our national life. This means if you take the sphere of language, it means the colonial language has to be replaced by non-colonial or Indian languages. This is seemingly honorable objective, but the language policy is actually absurd or illogical and inappropriate to the author. Here by language policy, the author actually means the three language policy. The three language policy actually meant a progressive replacement of English with Hindi. Though it was hoped to work out since 1950, it did not work out in the expected manner. The reason why the author says the year 1950 is that because Indian constitution came into force in the year 1950. At that time itself, it had provisions such as Article 344, Clause 2, Subclass B about restrictions on English and then promotion of Hindi by Article 351 also. This language policy did not work out in India because of various reasons. One is, it has been felt that the project to remove English is unnecessary because it was once a colonial language, but now it has transformed into a global language of culture, science and technology and world politics. And it is called a global or a universal language because of its ability to absorb words from other languages. Secondly, the intent to replace English with Hindi is based on an erroneous or wrong understanding that all languages are similar. That is both Hindi and English are similar. And what's wrong in replacing sort of idea? The author says that all Indian languages including Hindi are languages of identity and cultural expression. But English is a language of mobility and empowerment. So, there is no point in comparing Hindi and English, like one cannot logically compare apple with an orange. This justifies the title of the article, that is Hindi or English comparing apples and oranges. Thirdly, the very learning of third language in school is not helpful, as it is not likely to be useful after the completion of school. Uh, we have many friends among us who have studied French in standard 11th and 12th and are using them nowhere. Well, that is a foreign language. The author says, if you take even an Indian language as third language after your mother tongue in English, it is normally not useful after school. For example, Bihar once opted for Telugu as third language and found it is of no use and then revoked that policy in the state. Even Andhra also has Hindi as the third language, but the author feels it is not helpful. Also, the author says that the three language formula is unconstitutional or against the spirit of Indian constitution. This is because Supreme Court in the case law of uh, Karnataka versus recognized unaided schools has stated that the imposition of learning in one's mother tongue is violation of fundamental right to freedom of speech and expression under Article 19.1a uh, of Indian constitution. That is, the government cannot force students to learn in their own mother tongue also. Thus, the author says it is unconstitutional to impose the learning of third language. Then, Article 343, Clause 3 of our uh, constitution imposes that the language policy shall have due regard to the industrial, cultural and scientific advancement of India. By this provision, the Supreme Court bench in the case law advanced the rationale for English because books for several subjects are available only in English and the concepts can be properly learnt only from such English books. Teaching these subjects in English may have a direct bearing 
and impact on the determination of standards of education. This is what Supreme Court felt with respect to forcing one to learn only in mother language. Then the three language formula is not only irrational but it is also impractical. This is because even under the revised uh, national education policy every state is required to teach one modern Indian language in addition to mother tongue and English. The author asks how will the states get teachers who have proficiency in all these modern Indian languages. These questions are not answered and it will also take huge costs to make such a system accessible for all. The author then states that by 2060 the South Indian states will face demographic decline. Demographic decline is the scenario when the population in these states become aged and there will be lesser children. At such a scenario the state is also expected to face shortage in attendant or service assistant laborers. In that condition, there could be migration from North India to South India. And for this, English is must, not Hindi. This view is according to the author. Having English as second language will thus promote mobility and economic development. And this is especially to the North India. This is because anyway, South India is not going to accept Hindi imposition. So, a North Indian worker has to either learn English or he will be clueless in South India if he or she migrate. Coming to suggestions, the author states that there should be only two language policy in India. The two languages are mother tongue and English. But to make this a national policy, constitutional amendment is required for part 17 of Indian constitution. Part 17 of Indian constitution deals with official language and it has articles from 343 to 351. The author says by an amendment the two language policy has to be made applicable throughout India. The author finds that in several states the children from poor families are not given credible English medium education. It is found that the rich students are getting English medium classes in private schools. Enrichment of English is also necessary for poor students and steps for this has to be taken. The author talks about Macaulay's test. This means asking the people what language they prefer to learn. It is referred to as a Macaulay's test because Macaulay suggested asking the people about their preferred language. That is rather than going by the narrow party's manifestos, the government should directly ask to the people. In some states, they rely over emphasis on one language, that is one local language. The author says this is also detrimental because for persons from such states, they will feel extremely difficult to negotiate in other states since they only know their own mother language. They don't know English or Hindi. This also has to be addressed in those appropriate state governments. Then the non-Hindi states, while they oppose Hindi imposition, at the same time, they should also build a better case for English as the second language throughout India. Then finally, all non-Hindi states should immediately work for getting an exemption from the three language formula just like Tamil Nadu. This shall be a starter for the states to press for two language policy with mother tongue and English all over India. Thus, the project to remove English from India remains misplaced and dangerous to development and integration. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. The display practice question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next news article, which is about the growth in India services sector. This discussion will be relevant in prelims preparation under current events of national importance. Next in economic development. The discussion can also be linked to GS paper 3 in the area Indian economy. The news article talks about PMI. So, let us first understand what is PMI to understand the article. PMI refers to purchasing managers index. It is an indicator of economic health for manufacturing and services sector. The PMI data is published by Japanese firm Nikkei, but it is compiled and constructed by market economics. This purchasing managers index provides an accurate and a timely set of data to understand industry conditions. 
This data is useful for the business decision makers and purchasing professionals to plan their purchase orders accordingly. Thus, Purchasing Managers Index acts as an indicator of business activity, economic health and investor sentiments. We saw in the above that market economics compiles certain data. This data is based on the variables tracked by market economics. This tracking of data is not direct but through surveys. The key features of this purchasing managers index are that it is released on monthly basis and that it is not revised after publication. There are two PMIs released for India. One is for the manufacturing sector and the other is for the services sector. So for the manufacturing, the purchasing managers of select companies in India are surveyed on variables such as output, new orders, stock levels, employment and prices. And for the services sector, the variables are business activity, new business, backlogs of work, prices charged, input prices, employment, expectations for activity, etc. Today's article is about the services sector PMI. The article states that the country's services sector activity has increased in May, but at a slowest pace. This may be because of the disruptions arised uh, from the elections in the earlier part of the month. This disruption hampered the growth of new work intake. These facts have been mentioned by the PMI survey. The seasonally adjusted Nikkei India Services Business Activity Index also fell to 50.2 in May from uh, 51.0 in April. This points to the slowest growth rate. The article states that the services PMI was in the expansion territory for the 12th straight month. Know that in PMI above 50 means expansion while a score below that denotes contraction. The survey however noted that there were signs that the slowdown may prove to be temporary. This is because companies have stepped up hiring and uh, became more confident about future pro prospects. Meanwhile. The seasonally adjusted Nikkei India Composite PMI Output Index was at 51.7 in May, which remained unchanged from April. With this, we have come to the end of this article. The display prelims question will be discussed in the last session. This article is a response with respect to the language discrimination and the related controversy because of draft national education policy. This article discussion will be helpful in your main syllabus in general studies under the area salient features of Indian society, diversity of India. The article discussion can also be linked to regionalism. The author says that there will be some disagreements with respect to structuring the education in any large and diverse country and India is no exception. The original draft national education policy 2019 as submitted by by Mr. Kasturi Rangan committee to the central government had a proposal that school children shall learn three languages. If a child is having Hindi as mother tongue, then she should learn three languages. One Hindi, her mother tongue, two English, three a modern Indian language. If a child is having a language other than Hindi as mother tongue, then she should learn three languages. One her mother tongue, two English and three Hindi. This proposal had huge opposition particularly from the politicians and the people from the southern states of India. They saw mandatory Hindi as a discrimination. This proposal in the unrevised uh, draft national education policy can easily be seen as discriminatory. It is discriminatory because such a mandate to learn only one language other than mother tongue and English is not available for children who have Hindi as mother tongue. That is, for example, take a child whose mother tongue is Kannada. This child has to learn Kannada, English and Hindi. On the other side, you take a child whose mother tongue is Hindi. Then this child will learn Hindi, English and any one modern Indian language. This child has many options for the third language and she has the freedom to choose whichever language she wants to learn, whereas it is only Hindi for other students. This is discriminatory character. The author says that this insistence for the children whose mother tongue is not Hindi is not credible. That is, 
this imposition is questionable or is without a credible basis. Here we see the author has used the word incredible in a negative connotation. Usually we use this word in the place of the term unbelievable. But the author uses the word incredible in the meaning non-credible or as questionable. So don't get confused. The author says that Hindi is one of the several languages spoken in India. He says that in Hindi belongs to the family of Indo-European languages. And Hindi is the only one in this family that is spoken in India among other languages. Note that these are the author's personal opinions. Indians also speak languages that are a part of Dravidian family. The languages spoken by the tribal population in India are not part of both these families of Indo-European languages or Dravidian languages. But in the contention, the languages of tribal people are not seen. The author says this is because of the extreme marginalization of tribal population. They also have a little hope that their voice will be heard. So the contention or conflict is between those who privilege Hindi through imposition and, impro and promotion of the Indian government versus the speakers of Dravidian language. Some of the Dravidian languages are Tulu, Kannada, Malayalam, Telugu and Tamil. The author says in the light of recent scientific advances, the imposition of Hindi is not based on credibility because based on the population genetics combined with the DNA evidence, one can say that migration has placed a very important has played a very important role in the constitution of Indian stock. Population genetics is the study of genetic variation within population. The findings with respect to the migration factor in India has been given in the book titled as Early Indians, the story of our ancestors and where we came from by Tony Joseph. The earliest migrations that constituted uh, Indian population were by the migrants who moved out of Africa. This is chronologically or based on time followed by migration by West Asians including Dravidians, then came the East Asians and finally came Aryans. The author says that the term Aryan is the self description of speakers of Indo-European languages. All Indians in that sense are immigrants. The immigration the author refers to is the immigration that happened thousands or hundreds of years before. So don't confuse with present time immigration. The author says of all the immigrants, the most recent immigrants in the stock in the Indian stock are Aryans. That is why the author says that it is poor performance or incredible to suggest a language policy that privileges the language of the most recent migrant. The author concludes that just because they are majority in some areas that should not mean their language can be imposed on relatively earlier immigrants. One should know that democracy is also about giving the protection of minorities and it is not about imposition by majoritarianism. Now let us move on to the analysis of next news article. Moving on to the last article for the day which is about the equator price to the Telangana's women farmers. The discussion will be relevant in prelims preparation under current events of national importance and uh, in general issues on climate change also. The discussion is also important in main syllabus under GS paper 1 in the area role of women. The news is that the UNDP has announced six women from DDS group as winner of Equator Prize. DDS is short for Deccan Development Society which functions in Telangana. Most of the women in the society are from oppressed sections. The age old practices along with more than uh, three decades of their work in the farming sector has brought them this price. The DDS has been offering a global solution to climate change like consuming fresh food which is grown locally. It will protect human health and will be helpful in protecting the soil health also. Now let us know about this equator price. The Equator Prize is organized by the Equator Initiative within the United Nations Development Program. It is awarded biennially, that is every two years. It recognizes the outstanding community efforts to reduce poverty through the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. As sustainable community initiatives take root through the tropics, they are laying the foundation for a global movement of local successes. 
these are collectively making a contribution for achieving the sustainable development goals the local and indigenous groups across the tropics demonstrate and exemplify sustainable development so the equator prize shines a spotlight on their efforts by celebrating them on an international stage this year is the 10th cycle of the UNDP equator prize it focuses on local communities and indigenous groups in rural areas that have developed innovative nature based solutions for climate change and sustainable development so it means the winning initiatives are taking action to protect and restore ecosystems promote local models for low carbon or climate smart agriculture or advance low carbon nature based alternatives to food fuel fiber and building materials the winning groups will receive 10000 us dollars they will be invited to participate in a series of policy dialogues and special events during the united nations general assembly in new york in september 2019 the themes of the equator prize for the year 2019 include advocacy for land and water rights social and environmental justice and gender equality with this we have come to the end of this discussion the displayed prelims question will be discussed in the next session moving on to the last session for the day that is the practice questions discussion session if you look at the first question it is about the gestational diabetes in this the first statement is correct because gestational diabetes is a condition which occurs during pregnancy in women and in this the blood glucose levels are above normal but below those levels of regular diabetic person so this makes the statement one as the correct statement now if you look at the second statement it is wrong because the statement states gestational diabetes leads to several communicable diseases in pregnant ladies and also in the offspring but during our uh, discussion we discussed that it leads to several non communicable diseases in pregnant ladies and also in offspring not communicable diseases okay certain non communicable diseases like uh, heart attacks stroke obesity and hypertension etc are caused due to this so this makes statement 2 as incorrect statement now if you look at the third statement it is also incorrect because it states gestational diabetes in the mothers does not affect the newborn babies just now we saw it affects the offspring also offspring means the newborn baby so which makes third statement also incorrect here the question asks for the correct statement only uh, statement 1 is correct so the correct answer to this question is option a 1 only the next question is about the manufacturing purchasing managers index for india and it is asking who releases this index if you look at the options it is given as ministry of commerce and industry then uh, central statistics office then uh, institute for supply management then nikkei india we know this is a very direct question nikkei india releases the manufacturing purchasing managers index for india and the institute for supply management releases uh, pmi for usa okay so don't confuse now let us see one main question based on gs paper 3 india relies on imports despite making a significant progress in solar power generation comment with relevant illustrations now for on answering this question first mention about the significant progress india has made in the solar power generation like uh, the achievement of uh, 20 gigawatts before uh, the target year of 2022 then also mention about then also mention about the uh, fall in the unit cost of uh, solar power then also about the world's largest solar plant then world's largest solar park etc now the question also mentions about india relies on imports so for this part you have to mention about the imports like we discussed in our analysis you have to talk you can take an example about china and uh, talk about the imports from china like how india is relying on low cost chinese imports and uh, also the chinese imports uh, accounts for 90% of indian imports regarding the solar technology also try to add your own view points based on today's analysis now let us see one main question based on gs2 in the context of language policy of india in school education can it be said that the policy requires modification from being a three language formula to a two language formula 
with mother tongue and english you may expect such a question in your mains exam or a question that deals with the language policy of india for this question you may shortly give a brief about the current three language policy in india that is based on the official language resolution passed by parliament in 1968 as we discussed in our analysis then we also discussed about this uh, three language policy and how tamil nadu has exempted from this uh, three language policy mention that also then for the second part of the question which states that uh, can we say that the policy requires modification here you may highlight the points such as the reasons given by the author in today's uh, main editorial discussion like uh, while hindi and other indian languages are languages of identity then english is a language of mobility and empowerment then uh, how learning a third language may not be helpful and all you can also take the example of bihar then you may also uh, suggest uh, going in for english and local language uh, that is the two language formula which will promote national integration and development as many southern states are actually very much concerned about their uh, local languages and may oppose hindi imposition add your own view points and other points discussed during the analysis you may take the other stand also that the three language policy is the best and one can uh, you may hear say that the constitution has provisions about uh, promotion of hindi and uh, slow and timely restriction on english also uh, we have to remove the colonial yoke or burden of english language then you can substantiate with these points and answering uh, and try to answer relevantly you can also add one more point by saying that three language policy is okay but the third language shall be uh, up to the individual's freedom to choose and not on government's policy and also mention what are the difficulties in this like uh, for all such modern indian languages adequate teaching facilities are required with this we have come to the end of today's session if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel for more updates on upsc civil service examination preparation